particularly the rich insight into the history of Thurarunga Maritime Rivers and the culture around this area. So thank you, truly. So we are here today to hear Bain Atwood and Daniel James discuss the work and life of Lee Cooper, a respected Aboriginal leader and social justice campaigner from the 1930s. Professor Bain Atwood is the author of William Cooper, An Aboriginal Life Story. He's the professor of history at Monash University and has held fellowships at the University of Hale. His 2009 book, Possession, Batman's Treaty and the Matter of History, won the Ernest Scott Prize for the most distinguished contribution to the history of Australia or New Zealand or colonial history. Daniel James is an, an award-winning Yorta Yorta writer, consultant, broadcaster, and social justice advocate. Daniel's work explores notions of empathy, intergenerational trauma, uh, um, sorry, hidden history and the political landscape that continues to shape the lives of Aboriginal people across the country. So some quick housekeeping. Please keep your phones on silent. You can wear a face mask if you would like to, and we have spare masks at the desk. You would have seen a flyer on your chair for Council's current community consultation on our heritage challenges and opportunities. Feedback from this consultation will be used to develop a new heritage strategy that will guide Council's heritage work in the future. There's a QR code on the back of the flyer if you'd like to provide your comments online, or if you'd like to talk and provide feedback to Council staff in person, you can approach us just behind the audience over there after the event. There's also a program evaluation form on your chair. Uh, if you need a pen, you can ask library staff. Bathrooms are available just past the computers over there, and we have an accessible and all-gender bathroom available at the front of the library. We'll be taking some photos today, so please let library staff know if you would prefer to not be in the photos. The Footscray Historical Society have copies of William Cooper and National Life Story available for purchase at the front of the library, and Bain is available to sign books after the event as well. And can I also direct you to a website, uh, williamcooper.monash.edu, which is the William Cooper and the Aboriginal League website for uh, learning more about the history of all of the incredible work that William Cooper uh, did. Um, so you can head there online afterwards to read more. The Living Museum of the West are here today, uh, and they're at the front of the library as well. So please take some time at the conclusion of the event to visit their table. And also you can have a look and read the panels that are just along the side of the library there. We'll have time for some Q&As at the end of the event, so please have a think if you have any questions. And I'd now like to hand over to Daniel and Bain, and I hope you enjoy the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, for your warm welcome. Uh, thank you to all of you for, uh, for coming out and uh, uh, braving this weather, uh, especially those of you who came along Diamond Road. Or um, effing Diamond Road, as it becomes known at four o'clock every uh, weekday. Um, but we're here tonight to uh, talk about um, a fellow that was a local to this place, now known as Footscray, for uh, a while. Um, he is someone that I am uh, related to. His sister is my great 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 grandmother, um, Ada Cooper, and um, I feel a close connection to the story in, in so many ways. Um, the story of uh, Uncle William, the founder of the Australian Aborigines League, has been gradually entering the consciousness of mainstream Australia over recent years. Uh, there are now buildings named after him. The formal federal seat of Batman is now named after him. Was changed to Cooper in his honour. Monash University has a William Cooper Institute. Richmond Football Club has a William Cooper Centre. And while Cooper's name is becoming more familiar to people, much of his story remains outside the Aboriginal community, where Cooper and his contemporaries are very much lauded as the brave innovators that they were. But William Cooper is more than just a name, or do I say it, a brand. And that's why the work that Professor Bain Atwood has done for quite some time now, um, a number of years, is so important to enlightening us all about the life story of William Cooper and the times in which he lived. And to kick us off tonight, to start, um, Bain's going to read um, an excerpt from William Cooper, uh, A Life, An Aboriginal Life Story, to uh, take a little bit. Thank you, Bain. Thanks, Daniel. Before I do this, um, can I thank Uncle Bill for welcome to country? Um, 
I acknowledge the Wurundjeri as the traditional owners. I'd also like to pay my respects to the Yorshaw people and to the members of the Cooper family who are here tonight, not only Daniel, but the Connell and the two others. <coughs> <clears throat> so the passage I'm going to read um, is from uh, the, opening of the, uh, the opening of the prologue to my book. On Saturday 7 August 1937, an unusual event occurred. An Australian newspaper published a feature story about an Aboriginal man that was based on an interview one of its leading journalists had conducted with him. The Aboriginal man was William Cooper. The Australian press often ran stories about the blacks or the Aborigines, but it was unprecedented for an Australian newspaper to commission a staffer to seek out an Aboriginal man and write a major story in which his own words were quoted at length and his views represented faithfully. Cooper, in his 76th year, was living in a humble workers' cottage in Footscray. He was the secretary of an organisation called the Australian Aborigines League. The occasion for this interview, word had got around that Cooper was giving serious consideration to whether the time had come for him to present to the Australian government a petition to the British King that he had drawn up and began to circulate among Aboriginal people four years earlier. The journalist who interviewed William Cooper was a young poet and writer, Clive Turnbull, whom many regard as the doyen of Melbourne's newspaper news. <laughs> In September 1933, Turnbull's newspaper, the Melbourne Herald, had published a report about Cooper's petition at the point it had been released. It was a short but boldly headlined article. Member for the House of Representatives for Natives, keen to be positioned, unique move. And in this art, brief article, the journalist wrote, Australia's native race, the Aborigines, is taking steps for the first time in its history to secure from the King representation in the Federal Parliament. This the report went on, is demanded as a right. Now, four years later, Cooper told Turnbull that he hoped to see a change for the better before he died, and that he was doing all he could to bring this about. Taking down a great roll of signatures on this petition to the British King, Cooper observed, if we cannot get full justice in Australia, we must ask the British King. There are 2,000 signatures here from Aboriginal people all over Australia. Pointing to one of the pages of the petition, Cooper added, those who could not sign their own names have made their marks. This petition called on the British King to intervene on the behalf of Aboriginal people in order to help prevent their extinction, provide better conditions, and grant them the power to propose someone to represent them in the federal parliament. Cooper explained to Turnbull, up until the present time, the condition of the Aboriginal people had been deplorable. Their treatment was beyond human reason. Cooper believed that the incumbent federal government was the first in Australia to take up the cause of his people. He observed that it is not enough. In his view, what he called a tradition of cruelty had been handed down from white generation to generation to the present day. He confessed to Turnbull, I sit here working hour after hour in correspondence with, with my people, thinking, how can we save them? He demanded to know what was being done for the principal needs of his people. Telling Turnbull, we talk to politicians and they say, yes, I'll do this and do that, but the years go on, and what is done? Cooper proceeded to sketch out for Turnbull the goals of his organisation, the Australian Aborigines League, which he had founded in 1933, emphasising the importance of the fact that it was an Aboriginal organisation. He told Turnbull, you may read the views even of sympathetic white men, but they are not our views. And for, reason, and for Cooper, the reason for this was clear. In his words, we are the sufferers, the white men are the aggressors. He went on to explain to Turnbull what he meant. And I quote him again, instead of lifting up our people, the early comers, but what he meant, the white people, the early comers to our country destroyed them. And this had clearly had lasting consequences. Cooper said, now our people have nothing, all were taken from them. They will have they will never have anything so long as the present state of things endures. Aboriginal people today, he went on, have a horror and fear of extermination. It is in the blood, the racial memory which recalls the terrible things done to them in years go by. As far as Cooper was concerned, the Australian government had a duty towards the country's first peoples. 
He said, you may ask where the money is to come from, but we have lost countless millions to the whites, the whole wealth of Australia. Are we not entitled to this? This is a constant theme in Cooper's political work. Turnbull, the journalist had gone to interview him, was a sympathetic listener. Had he not been, we would not have this unusually rich testimony from William Cooper. <laughs> and I don't think we have to go far to search to understand why Turnbull was a sympathetic listener. I went to him, Turnbull explained to his readers, because I've been long interested in the, what he called the problem of the Aborigines. This was so, he went on, because my own countrymen in Tasmania, by, com by a combination of cruelty and stupidity, succeeded in exterminating a whole race within 75 years. But if Turnbull was damning of his ancestors in Tasmania, he was just as critical of his contemporaries in Melbourne. Although any number of people are willing to be sentimental at any moment of the day about the minorities of other countries, the Jews in Germany, the Negroes in the United States, the Basques in Spain, and so on and so on, provided they are sufficiently far away, nobody of any political colour, except a few religious and anthropological enthusiastic enthusiasts, cares tuppence about our own minority, which is perishing before our eyes. Turnbull insisted, one can make a melancholy parallel between the pious sentiments of government pronouncements side by side with a record of expropriation, a polite word for theft, and oppression a hundred years ago and those of today. With the exception that Aborigines are no longer publicly hunted down, their treatment has, for all practical purposes, changed little in a century. Thanks for that, Bain. With all that in mind, some 80 odd years ago, you were thinking of these things. What, what do you think William Cooper would make of the current political climate of today, where some things have indeed changed, but some things brutally remain the same? It's a very, very good question. Perhaps one way to talk about this is in terms of Cooper's most important um, campaign, which was his petition to the British King, which, as I said, called for Aboriginal representation or an Aboriginal voice in Parliament. And I suppose with the forthcoming constitutional referendum in mind, setting aside the fact that he was, he was a very religious man, he would probably say, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> this still hasn't happened. So the cause that he fought for so tenaciously after he came down from his own country, your, your country, in 1933, to Melbourne to really you know, launch his political campaign and spent you know, the next seven years in Footscray repeatedly um, advancing the cause in the petition, writing letters to government again and again and again. I assume he'd be saying, <laughs> and he, he was in despair near the end of his life. That, um, Very frustrating. Very, very frustrated. Um, and strikingly, there's very little evidence that he, he was embittered by this experience. Um, I mean, there's, there's times where I think he was deeply dispirited by the lack of progress, but he was, he was determined. <laughs> he had guts. He, he, he continued. Um, and I think given that he was you know, so dispirited that in his lifetime he couldn't, he couldn't make this difference, he couldn't bring about this change. So I think that, so here we are, what, we're now 90 years beyond the point where he drew up this petition. And of course there's a difference with the forthcoming referendum. It's, it's, it's seeking, it's a very modest proposal as I guess we all know, seeking an Aboriginal voice to Parliament. What Cooper was seeking, as I've said, was, a, was Aboriginal, an Aboriginal voice in Parliament. So at the, at the very least, as I'm saying, he would have been struck by the fact that this was still a matter that was having to be fought for and the opinion polls seem to be telling us that this is there's no done deal. There's no done deal. This, is, this holds um, in, in, the, in the balance. Um, he might, oh no, he certainly would have been struck by the fact that so much of what he was calling for is still crucial to the Aboriginal struggle, but more resources, what I would call more capital, and you know, thinking of the word capital in a wide sense of the word. That, that, that most people, most Aboriginal people, still lack. And so that what was central to, to, to his struggle, to bring about equality in any real sense, is clearly still um, an enormous, enormous battle and still
through the struggles that has that has to be fought. Swing in the breeze. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll we'll swing back around to the um, to the petition to the king because in many ways it was what he considered the central part of his working and political life. But when we're talking about William Kibble, we're talking about an epic life, a life born a generation after first contact. Uh, could be argued that his earliest name has been indeed one of the final robberies of his people. Uh, the loss of his people suffered was not only in his lived experience, but as he says himself, it was, it was in his blood. It was something feeling injustice, being angered by it, but it was another thing doing something about it, especially in William's time. So, Bain, what was the environment that created William Cooper's activism? This is a really important question because I, th I think so many of the stories we, we are told necessarily focus on the oppression of Aboriginal people. But one of the, the critical questions, I think perhaps more so for Aboriginal people than, than for non-Aboriginal people, is to say, well, how did those like William Cooper? What, what enabled him to, to speak out? What enabled the political work he did? And um, I hesitate to say the yorty ought to work fortunate because I don't think any Aboriginal people were fortunate in the wake of British colonisation. But in this, insofar as you could say that they had some good fortune, it lay in the fact that the nature of their, their country, that it was a, it was in a riverine environment along the Murray River, but for the yorty ought to, in the wake of the pastoral invasion of their lands, which begins in 1840, and that they are likely pushed off those lands. They nonetheless still retained access to the river. And of all the food resources, the food resources, the river was probably more important than the land. And so they were able to maintain themselves to some degree by continuing to use these river run resources. It's also the case that um, your, your country in, in white or colonial terms is rather isolated and there's something of a shortage of white labour. And so, for better or worse, um, the pastoralists engaged Aboriginal people to work on the, on, on, on the pastoral runs that, they, that they've created. And that included William Cooper from, from, from a very young age. Now, that no doubt suited the purposes of the pastoralists. There's no doubt a degree of exploitation. But what's important is that by becoming a part of the labour force, the Yorta Yorta, as well as the river, were able to remain on country. So they were able to rem continue to have connections to their country. So that's part of the story of, of, of that, that the Yorta Yorta, um, you know, they suffered, there's no doubt that they suffered devastation. I mean, there's, there's the, the dispossession I mentioned. There is the dec decimation of their numbers, there's some, some degree of displacement, there is disease and there's later, later discrimination. But, Cooper and the Yorta Yorta are fortunate, I think, that from the mid 1870s they encounter two missionaries, Daniel and Janet Matthews. Now, I guess it's fair to say, isn't it, Daniel, that the legacy of, of missionaries for Aboriginal people is, is, an, is a mixed one. Well, to, the, to highlight that point, um, uh, I guess you could say William's advocacy was very much of its time. Um, he personally believed that missions were the best thing that ever happened to his people, whereas the generation of advocates after him, um, uh, Jack Patton and Bill Onis, Jack Patton in particular, believed that missionaries were the worst things to ever happen to our Aboriginal people. Now, Jack was born on Cumbergundra in 1905, uh, William was born before missions had really even taken foot in that part of the country. So that, I guess, conflicting views from two generations of Aboriginal act activists and leaders in itself tells us something, doesn't it? It, it? it does. I mean, I think it's clear that part of the, what I refer to as the missionary legacy is that uh, the missionaries um, believed in what they saw as British civilization and clearly they they believe in, in Christianizing Aboriginal people. And at the same time they have a very derogatory view of 
Aboriginal culture and traditional Aboriginal culture. And so there's, there's what we can say, an attack on Aboriginal culture. That's clearly the downside. The upside is that, and this says a great deal about the attitudes of other colonisers at the time, they profoundly believed that Aboriginal people were of the same blood, that they were, that they were also God's people. They believed um, that uh, Aboriginal people had the same capacities. And perhaps most importantly for the Yorta Yorta, missionaries like Daniel and Janet Matthews were convinced, or what Aboriginal people of course already knew, that they were the traditional owners of the land. The missionaries believed profoundly that Aboriginal people were owed some form of compensation. And compensation is one of the words that was used in the mid to late 19th century in Australia by those like missionaries and those called humanitarians. So they, they believed very strongly um, that Aboriginal people had the rights of British subjects and that they had um, the greatest claim on that of anybody because they had been the traditional owners and they had been dispossessed of, of, of their birthright. Um, it's also the case that missionary figures, they're not only as, as, as Daniel, they're not only white folk like Daniel and Janet Matthews, but they're also Grandpa James. Uh, this is your story, so <laughs> how about I go back to you? Uh, well, yeah, Thomas James, uh, Grandpa James is his name, is where I take my uh, name from. He was a, um, uh, uh, a Mauritian uh, immigrant, uh, the son of indentured slaves, um, met Daniel Matthews uh, on a beach in Brighton while the Onloga singers had come down to perform as a choir on the beach, as they often did and did tours of Melbourne around the place. And struck up a friendship with Daniel and a professional relationship as well, and ended up uh, back at Onloga Beach, where um, incidentally it is um, believed to be Malaga itself is believed to be the former junction of the, the Golden and um, uh, Murray Rivers, Kaola, Dungola Rivers, um, before that there was a before there was a, a major earthquake about ten thousand years ago. So that in itself meant that a lot of the old people thought, okay, well he's chosen this place. This place is sacred to us, um, and that's why so many people uh, partly ended up there. So he ended up. Um, Grand, Grandpa James as the schoolmaster, the dentist, the um, uh, the the um, I guess doctor. He had trained to become a surgeon before contracting typhoid, which meant that his hands became shaky as a result of that illness. But he um, ended up moving to Maloga and ended up um, marrying um, Ada uh, Cooper, who was William's sister. Um, some of the research I found was that um, uh, Rupert, uh, sorry, Thomas actually had to um, pay a woman in um, Camberwell a hundred dollars for a broken promise of marriage. A hundred pounds, I should say, which is a lot of money back then. Um, he changed his name, so he was the first James, his original name was Peter Shigit, um, which means that he was the first James to break a heart, but he wasn't the last. <laughs> um, but if we can get back to, um, to where we were, before, William even got to Maloga, and he was the last to convert to Christianity. He, um, along with his mother, Kitty, and uh, some of his siblings, uh, were either working or living on Moira Station, which eventually fell into the ownership of a fellow called John o. Shancy, who um, made his way from being a, um, a curtain salesperson, much through the wealth of his wife, to becoming the second premier of Victoria, um, the colony as it was back then. And during that period, uh, William was taken from Moira or invited to go from Moira to a place called Tara, which is this stately mansion in Camberwell, which still exists. It's now an aged care facility, oddly enough, um, to spend several years there. Now that's the period of life that we really don't know much about what happened, but it must have made an impression on the young fellow to go from living ostensibly on the land to living in this stately mansion or the stately mansion's quarters for a number of years and be exposed to all sorts of life up and down the social scale. Um, we don't really know what sort of impression that left, but we can speculate what it is. Yes, we can. I guess you're raising, yes, Daniel, two questions. One is 
how do we tell the story of an Aboriginal man who is generational? Or how at least do I, as an academic historian, tell that story, given that academic history is a discipline which relies very much on the historical record that's created at the time? What sources do we have? And this is one of the challenges of, for me in writing this, this, this life story of, of, of William Cooper, that um, there's no what we call private archive. Um, there's no collection of letters or anything like this that lived. Strikingly, there are photographs, and maybe we'll turn back later and talk about photographs because I think they, in some ways, um, illuminate the story. And so I included as many photographs as I could with the permission of the Cooper family in in in, in this in this book. Um, Cooper is unusual though for an Aboriginal man of his generation, and that there is quite a large public archive, which is the letters and so forth that he sent to government. So National Archives of Australia, there is state archives, the collection of papers of various white people. You can find Cooper's letters there. But nonetheless, and especially for his childhood, including this time that he spent in O'Shaughnessy's house in Camberwell, there is barely any historical in the, in the time. Um, what we do know, and as you, as you say, Daniel, we can speculate, uh, and it seems that Cooper, as well as this kind of your to your background that I was talking about before, which enabled the protest of your to your to later, um, is the fact that he probably moved around more than other Aboriginal people of his generation. And part of that is coming down to Melbourne, um, to O'Shaughnessy's house, returns later to, to, to Morris Station. But then beyond that, um, even with Maloga Merck mission and then its successor known as Kamarajanja, even though he's living there some of the time, like most Aboriginal men like at that time, in order to survive and support his family, he has to move on and off these missions or, or, or reserves. And he not only moves around Victoria and New South Wales, but he goes much further afield. Um, we know that he went up at, at, um, to the Gulf of Carpentaria. We know that he was um, involved on in the sh famous Shearer's strike in the 1890s. We also know that he was in New Zealand at some point, and the relevance of that perhaps we, we, we'll come back to. So, and in the course of that, he, he very much, in my view, becomes a Labour man. He um, becomes a trade unionist. We know that throughout his long life, he was a subscriber to one of the main um, Labour or trade union newspapers of the day, the Australian Worker. Um, and so he gains a wider knowledge of, of, of the world, if you like, and he, and, he, and he, I think, acquires skills in representing not only his own people, but I think other white, other, other white workers. So, and, and so when he establishes the Australian Aborigines League in 1933, it's not the first Aboriginal political organisation to be established in Australia. Other organisations are established in the 1920s. But the Australian Aborigines League is unusual in the sense that those other organisations formed in Western Australia and, and elsewhere in New South Wales, they're very much what I would call local or regional organisations. What distinguishes the League is that's part of it, its brief, um, representing people in this part of the country, and especially the Yorta Yorta, but it also speak, seeks to speak for all Aboriginal people in Australia, and that was unusual at the time. And, I, and I'm sure it owed something to Cooper's earlier experience of life, and that, that, that it, was, it, was much, it was much broader. And all of this contributed to what we might loosely call his political education. Yeah. I think another thing that's worth mentioning too is that he was a, he was a big fella. He was over six foot up. Um, Back then, of course, there was like um, a, you know a giant, broad, strong. Um, he, he had a a, a world-class moustache. Yeah, he was also um, very handsome, as you can very, see. Very, very handsome fellow. <laughs> um, he would have been um, an imposing figure. He would have been someone that I am guessing people would have looked to for natural leadership. I think that's that's right, and this is where I suppose. The photographs that I mentioned before are, yeah, really are, are, are so important to, to get a sense of himself because to go back to what I was saying before about the absence of, of, of what I call a private archive, when you try and write a life story or what's more traditionally called a biography, 
what's usually fundamental for, for at least for an academic historian is that your subject will have will, will have left writings about their private life and will will, will give you a sense of, of of what they were. And sure, I could talk to um, Cooper's surviving grandson, Woody Turner, who spent um, some time during the period that Cooper is in, in Footscray. Uh, Woody Turner was, was, was a young boy at, at, at that time. Um, but the photographs, they, they're something else. And um, I don't know about you, Daniel, but I guess what I'd call my favourite photograph is this, Walking down the street. Is this photo yeah. of Cooper striding down Nicholson Street in Footscray. And you just, this, this, What's the saying there that a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words or whatever it is? And this this picture, now I don't know how, the circumstances of when was, this was taken, um, but we know it's Nicholson Street because you can see in the background the, um, the names of various well-known at the time um, foot stores in Footscray. And he is striding down the street and you just get the sense of his purpose, um, his dignity, as you say, is yeah. his, his, his height. He's clearly a very proud man, and we we, we know from from there are some written sources. Okay, they're not they're not written by Aboriginal people. Um, the one I'm thinking of is a is a letter by Arthur Verdo, who's a white fellow who became the president of the Australian Aborigines League and was was fundamental to Cooper's Cooper's work. And and Verdo reports that 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 Cooper is very much regarded as as the senior figure. In the Melbourne Aboriginal community, in the 1930s, it seems there's something like a hundred or so uh, Aboriginal people living in Melbourne. Most of them live most in, them around, uh, most, most, most of them live around Foots, most of them live around Fitzroy. Fit, 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 yeah. So there's a kind of question of why Cooper came to live in Footscray rather than to live where other Aboriginal people were living in Footscray. In Footscray, I mean, do you have any views about why? Probably the same as I live in Docklands. Um, <laughs> Um, well, there's a lot of employment. There was a lot of employment through the ropery here. Um, uh, accommodation was relatively cheap, as it was in Fitzroy. Um, but I think it might it may have been a case of whoever first planted their flag here, others came to follow. And so um, Uncle William planted his flag here, firstly at 120 Ballarat Road, um, lived in several places in between. And so people from uh, uh, you already got a country from the Cumberland Gunja and from other missions. We're just saying, okay, well, this mob have planted their flag here. We're going to uh, follow them. They've got some connections that might help with employment. Um, and indeed, we want to start becoming involved in some of the political um, activism. Um, I, I think that I think the main reason he, he chose Footscray probably would have been um, uh, necessity and economic, mm-hmm. and then others will, would have followed. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, my my sense, more particularly, is that uh, one of his children, one of his daughters, was was already here. And yeah. m- as far as I can tell, um, I think the first ed- address he stays in, the first place in Ballarat Road, or was it the second? I think it's the first. Was that being run by one of his daughters as a as a as a board, right. boarding house? So, in other words, what this tells us, I think, is the ongoing importance. Not just a family, but but of kin, and the the story about Cooper and, and and the league, and what I'm very careful to do in the book, is not to make what I think is the mistake that some people, white people, have made in telling the story about Cooper, and that's to foreground Cooper too much. I mean, Cooper, make my mistake. Yeah. I think Cooper was a remarkable man, but he wasn't exceptional. And around him, in Melbourne in the 1930s, are other Yorta Yorta people, Margaret Chaka, Doug Nichols. Uh, and others who are fundamental to the work, and they that, they are family and kin. They the, the Australian the Aboriginals place. for all the fact that they're seeking to speak for Aboriginal people generally in Australia. It's very much a yorta yorta organisation. Um, I, yeah. I think um, uh, yeah, he 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 was a remarkable man, but he had a tremendous amount of support around him um, uh, through some of your work. By, you know, we come to understand that um, Thomas and Shadrach spent many years in Melbourne, pretty much setting the scene for the for the establishment of the Australian Aborigines League. Um, Shadrach, in particular, was a beautiful writer. I might just say he was an incredible writer. Um, but 
the, the, the establishment of the league was something that took quite a long time to, to, to come, come along. What I might do is I might skip ahead from his days um, where, you know, he started his political activism um, at the Lodal with, with some of his fellow um, uh, family members and um, uh, peers. Um, and then they eventually won what they call the pastoral land, which was Kamagunja, which is Yorta Yorta for, for home. And that had a very checkered history um, from, from the very outset. But we can go back to that later if we have time, but I just thought that we might try and um, skip forward a little bit. So, um, look, there's so much we could cover in Lee's lifetime as a shearer, a rep for the Australian Workers' Union, the tragic loss of two wives, Annie and Agnes, to disease. In Abby's case, he lost her to typhoid only nine days after losing their second child, Bartlett, to the same disease. This happened at uh, Kamrajanja, a place where he actually uh, blamed um, partly for the death of those two um, because of the poor sanitation that was there at the time. Uh, he lost his second eldest son, Daniel, named after uh, Daniel Matthews, during the First World War, which is perhaps uh, a loss that probably shaped him as much as any other. Um, but after raising his children ostensibly with the woman that would become his third and final wife, Sarah, he decides in 1933 to come to Footscray and establish the Australian Aborigines League. He is by any standard at that time an old man at this period. So my question has always been, was it his idea or was he controlled into being the figurehead and being the actual leader? What do you think? I think it's, it's very much his idea, um, and there's quite a lot of from the historical record which which supports that. Um, I guess one of the reasons why he, rather than somebody else, becomes this leader is the fact that you've you've mentioned his his longevity. That it's unusual, I suppose, for most people of his generation, let alone Aboriginal people, to live into their seventies. And so he's a, he's I mean he's a real he's a real survivor. Um, I mean, just to refer back to that er earlier period that, that you mentioned before, he, by the time he comes down here in 1933, and he says he has come down to Melbourne because he recognises that he needs the resources of a large city in order to launch this political campaign. And he... I've lost my train of thought for a minute. Um, in coming down, and you know, one of his first political acts is to drop the petition to the king. And there's this long tradition of yorta yorta petitioning by this time. Um, and the, 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 the Jameses are, in particular Grandpa James, is fundamental to this. The first petition that the yorta yorta brought up is to the governor of New South Wales in 1881. And, I, and almost certainly um, Thomas James is responsible for drawing this up. One of the things we need to recognise is that those of Cooper's generation had little chance to be schooled in the white Australian system. He, interestingly, I think, starts to teach himself to read before the missionaries come and offer some schooling, but he has a relatively brief period of time schooling. And it's clear that he's a very eloquent speaker, <laughs> but on his own admission, he, he finds it difficult to, to, to write. He, he, clearly, he's an avid reader. He reads well. But um, by 1933, whatever skills he had developed in writing, they have, if you like, <coughs> received it. And so he's reliant on those like Jadrack James, who, as you said, then was a very, a very fine writer. Um, when he starts his campaign in 1933, Jadrack James has already articulated quite a number of things, and that includes calling for an Aboriginal representation in, in the federal parliament. In some ways, and this is not a criticism of Cooper, there's little that's new in his campaign. It's, 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 you can see that it's been talked about by the Yorta Yorta over a number of years, and Chadwick James has articulated this 1929, 1930, and <coughs> uh, uh, it's reported in, 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 in local newspapers. But it's Cooper, who, for whatever reason, he's the one that, that, that leads this campaign from 1933. And, and, and in the beginning, even though he gets some support from a white woman by the name of, of, of Helen Bailey, it's, to some degree, I mean, it, it depends on 
on his work and as I said because he, he has some trouble writing it's a real struggle and we, we, we can we know we've got the letters that he started to write in 1933 in his own hand and you can see that um, he's struggling to, to to spell and to punctuate in a way that would be acceptable to government but he sticks to the task it's also the case that that he is poor that he is dependent on an old age pension and he's exceptional he's able he's eligible for an old age pension but only by virtue of the fact that he's no he's not living on an aboriginal reserve by removing off the off an aboriginal reserve and being of so-called mixed descent his father was white um, he's eligible for an old age pension it's also the case that because he has lost his son daniel that daniel mentioned before he's also eligible for the pension that was provided to um, one relative of a man who'd lost his life in the First World War. Of course, usually it would be the widow of a man, but Daniel um, was single when he died in Belgium um, in 1916. Thank you. Um, and so the pension goes to Cooper. So he has these two sources of income, but they're very, very small sources of income. And he's also, during the time he lives in Fitzroy, he and Sarah, his wife, take responsibility for the children of some of William's children. They recognise, I think, that if they do not take responsibility for the ch these children, there is this enormous risk that they are going to be removed, they're going to become part of what we now know as the stolen generation. So he has a small source of income. Um, he's supporting not only Sarah, but um, a number of children at various times during this period in the Fitzroy. And we know that in order to save money for the cause, he doesn't use public transport. He walks from here into Spencer Street, where Arthur Godot, the man I mentioned before, who becomes the president of the league, um, uh, has, has, his, has his day job, so to speak. Um, we know that when, he, when he's trying to circulate the petition, uh, he can't always afford <coughs> the cost of postage. So this is really, this, he's living in enormous poverty, as of course most Aboriginal people are living, but nonetheless, he. He, 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 he sticks at it. I think, I think the remarkable thing about him, I think, I think that maybe not uh, an that despite any sort of deficiencies he might have had um, you know, with his literacy, was the tremendous amount of effort and intent and the hard work, um, the, the work that, 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 that never ceased. It was something that he did not have to do. He could have easily retired back to somewhere like Barmer and with a very comfortable existence um, seeing out his days, but he goes basically into battle to, to fight for his people towards the very um, end of his life. Um, terms of how much time do we have left? Time to another five and then questions. Yeah, another five and then questions. And they all live happily ever after, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, one thing I wanted to touch upon, uh, Bain, because um, you've identified a very... Um, uh, uh, well in, in some of your books and, and your own, was the idea that William had around this thing that he called thinking black. And it was at pretty much at the core of his advocacy. It was at the core of his advocacy. Um, and we need to get some of his greatest hits in too, by the way. So the march from 27 Hampton, um, Southampton Street to uh, uh, the German consulate in 1938 to protest the uh, treatment of the Jews in Europe um, was something that <laughs> it's just one part of his life, but it's an amazing, epic story just within itself. But thinking black, what did he mean? Thanks, thanks, Danny. This is this is this is really important, and especially so in our current context with this forthcoming referendum. When Cooper was talking about this demand for Aboriginal representation in the federal parliament, he explained on more than one occasion to federal government ministers. That the reason for this, this reason for this call for an Aboriginal voice in Parliament, was that white fellas, however sympathetic they were to Aboriginal people, could not, in his words, think black. For him, Aboriginal people were different. They could think black, and white fellas could not think black. And in Cooper's terms, this is how he explained it, is that Aboriginal people had had a particular historical experience in Australia. As I said from that passage I read, you know, where Cooper said, we are the sufferers, and in fact he said, 
we did say it at some point, the white folk are the conquerors. So Aboriginal people were, if you like, were positioned differently. They had this exp his historical experience of place, decimated, discriminated against. And this was the source of their thinking in a way that was fundamentally different from the white people or what we can call the colonisers. And this was the reason why he thought it was vital for Gopa to be able to hear and have the opportunity to listen to Aboriginal perspectives because their perspectives was different. And I think this is remains sad, still what's important. This, I think, underpins this forthcoming constitutional referendum. That, in Cooper's view, government policy and practice was poor, it suffered from the fact that it just relied on input from white folk. And Cooper and Shadrach James, at various points we can see that they not only called in for Aboriginal representation in the federal parliament, I believe that they were calling for Aboriginal representation in really all levels of government, whether it was um, those who administered Aboriginal reserves, where at least in this part of the country, a large number of Aboriginal people live, or whether it was local government, or whether it was state government. So it wasn't just federal government. That, that what they're saying is that we'd all be better off if, if you white fellas could just listen to what we're what we're saying, include our perspective of thinking black in what in what, in what we do. Um, and what, what informed that before we throw the questions and get your elevator pitch as to why uh, 27 Southampton Street should be on the Victorian Heritage Trail? Right. Um, uh, what informed that history showed us is that the further away decisions were made about black people and Aboriginal people in this country, the worse those decisions were made and the greater the impact they had in a negative sense on Aboriginal people. So when you're thinking about the referendum that's coming up in this October, I'm not going to tell you which way to vote, but I will ask you to take that into consideration when, you come, when it comes to your thinking around the matter. Uh, four questions. Uh, 27 Southampton Street. Why should it have been on the Heritage Register? Sorry. No, not at all. This is the point where, where why this is oh, kind yeah, of a, this kind is, of a yeah, this reason we're here. Yeah, this is the point, this is the point where, where you and I are probably going to disagree. <laughs> <coughs> no, it's, um, as, you, as you know, 27 Southampton Street has just been placed on the Victorian Heritage, Heritage Register. Register. Yeah. And let me make clear that I think this is absolutely appropriate, this is the right thing to do. But I believe that some of the reasons that Heritage Victoria put forward in recommending this are, let me just say, problematic. Now, I could speak at this for, for some length, so I'll try and keep, keep this Sure. Um, I believe that Cooper should best be remembered and respected for his petition to the king, his general fight for better conditions for Aboriginal people, <coughs> his role in the Kumaganja strike or walk off of 1939, his suggestion for the Aboriginal Day of Mourning in 1938. His raising questions about whether there should be an Aboriginal regiment in the Second World War, he said very clearly, why should we be fighting the land of Australia where Australia has dispossessed us our land? Why should we be fighting for Australia when Aboriginal people are not truly citizens in this country? Those, according to the historical record, are Cooper's most important campaigns. Now, in going back over 20 years ago now, um, my colleague Andrew Marcus, who was the first academic historian to write about William Cooper, Andrew Marcus and I published a small book called Thinking Black. And it was a collection of a, some, a hundred historical documents, almost all by, by Cooper. And in the introduction to that book, we, in effect, said that we thought that, in as much as we thought this was important, we thought that the protest of the Australian Aborigines League 
to the German consulate in Melbourne in December 1938, protesting against the recent Nazi German persecution of Jewish people in what's known as Crystal Mark. We said that we thought this was a relatively insignificant part of Cooper's story. Now, in the 20 years since then, a story had been told, which I loosely call, because this is what at least some people call, the story of William Cooper as the man who stood up to Hitler. Now, this story, in my view, I've just written a, written a long essay about this, which is going to be published in some obscure book in Canada. But I'm just actually today um, wrote something for the inside story, which I trust will be published soon. And I come to regard the story as, I have to say, deeply problematic in one way or another. I mean, part of it is, and this is me as an academic historian, I don't, it, it's, it's, at least according to the historical record of the time, there is no evidence that Cooper did some of what is said. The story of Cooper is the man who stood up for Hitler, says he did. did. And that includes even the question of whether Cooper was a member of that deputation. The historical, the newspapers of the day don't, <coughs> don't tell us who of the Australian Aboriginal League was part of that deputation. This story also says that the deputation walked from Southampton Street to the German consulate in Collins Street. There's no contemporary historical record that this happened. But that's the least of the reasons why I think this story is problematic. I think this story works has a particular logic, which I hope I can encapsulate in a few words. This is a story, let me be clear, that, is, that was first told and circulated by particular kind of institutions and organisations, which are Jewish organisations. The story is first told by the Jewish Holocaust Centre in Melbourne. It works within what I would call the logic of the polit what we call the politics of recognition. Now, the point of the politics of recognition is that non-Aboriginal, in, in the Australian context, that non-Aboriginal people will recognise the loss and the pain and the suffering of Aboriginal people. That's the point of the politics of recognition. And that's a crucial kind of politics in my view. I think this story of Cooper is the man who stood up to Hitler, forgive me, perverts the logic of the politics of recognition. Because the point of the story, and as I said, this is a story that is advanced by Jewish organisations and institutions and, and then has since been taken up by a lot of other people. The logic of the story is that Cooper is recognised not because of the loss and pain and suffering of his people, but he is recognised because he draws attention to the loss, pain and suffering of Jewish people. The very logic of the story is that Cooper bore witness to the Jewish Holocaust, which for what it's worth, in my view, is an event that was yet to happen in 1938. But that's the logic of the story, and it repeatedly draws attention not to what some of us, and I know this is controversial, call the Holocaust that happened. It's a story that repeatedly draws our attention to the Jewish now let me be clear. That was a catastrophic history. And it must be and should be, and of course is being remembered. But we live in this it was an equally catastrophic history. In my view, it was a more consequential history, in the sense that the legacies of colonization of this country for Aboriginal people are clearly the risk of facile comparisons. At the very least, it's a deeply consequential history. It continues from generation from generation. This is what Cooper, and, and when Cooper goes, the other part of the problem of the story of Cooper is the man who stood up to Hitler, is that it tells a story which guts what Cooper and the Australian Aboriginal League did. Guts all the politics. The Australian Aboriginal League was a political organisation. As such, it was, whatever it did, it was necessarily strategic. And we know that when it protests against 
the Nazi German persecution of Jews in December 1938. It is trying to do. It's not draw attention to an event that has yet to happen in the Jewish Holocaust. What it is trying to do, it is trying to draw a parallel between the Nazi German racial persecution of Jewish people in Germany and the persecution of Aboriginal people in this country by at least some Australian governments. That's the point of the protest. We know this, I think, because this is what the petition says, in part. We know that 10 days later, Cooper complains as Turnbull, and this is one of the reasons why I start the book where I do, Clive Turnbull says, Australians are very concerned about the persecution of minorities overseas, but they are safely distant. They don't seem to care much about the persecution of Aboriginal people here. Cooper complains that this is what is going on. Several weeks later, he writes to Robert Menzies, who's the Prime Minister at the time. He says much the same thing. Several months later, he writes and says the same thing. A year later, Doug Nichols also says, all this talk about racial minorities and the treatment overseas. Aboriginal people are a racial minority. Why aren't Australians caring about us? Yeah. As you can see, I think this is really important, what's happened. I think that this story about man, of Cooper as the man who stole it Hitler, ostensibly, recognises Cooper. But I think it misrecognises him and the work that the Australian Aborigines led to. And to be honest, this is the reason why I wrote this book. To shift attention back to the most important reasons why Cooper should be remembered. I'll just wait one more point and then, and then I'll stop. Well, it's really interesting if you read what Cooper's doing, and, and I, I said this in, in the part of the prologue I read, that what he's concerned about is his, this fear of the extinction of Aboriginal people. And I think this informs the petition. As I said, you know, when he's talking to Clive Turnbull, and it's such an important piece of evidence, because what we know, here's Pippet speaking, it's, the, it's really the only time he speaks in the historical record. The rest of the time he's writing, we don't ultimately even know the process of, of how Cooper and Arthur Bigot wrote the letters. Here he is speaking, what does he talk about? He talks about racial memory. It's a collective memory that the Yorta Yorta and other Aboriginal people have of this threat of extermination. And when <coughs> they learn of the Nazi persecution of Jews, they identify. Uh, the word, this is different from empathizing. This is identifying with the Jewish people. They know that history because it's their history. Try, he, you know, instead, the story of Cooper as the man who stole it, you know, it praises perhaps you know, rightly. Cooper is this humane man empathizing with Jewish people. But as I said, it's a story that guts what Cooper did of its politics. And this is what, this is crucial to the way I think Cooper should be. Any questions? <laughs> yes, look, um, look, you know, thank you very much, Bain, for another eloquent uh, presentation on, you know, your research. Um, I'd like to just quickly bring it back to and the land that Winnie Cooper and many of the Australians actually were living, you know, back in the 1930s. And I'd like you to reflect on the significance of an event that occurred in 1937 on Australia Day at the junction of the Maribyrnong and Yarra River um, when the leader of the Australian Natives Association gave a, <laughs> gave a speech um, basically espousing the white Australia policy um, in the presence of William Cooper, who was attending there today, with... Um, Princess Liliata, Auntie Margaret Tucker, and um, that was quite a significant event that triggered a number of letters from Auntie William after that. Could you just reflect for the people who sit here what the significance of that event might have been on Australia Day, January 1937? Thank you. Um, I'm going to do my best to remember this. I, I first wrote about this in my book about Baptist Street, and then I, I write about it again in, in the life story of William Cooper. So as, as has been said, this is a moment um, early in 1937 where Cooper and the members of the Australian Aborigines League are invited by 
Isaac Selby and I think a local white footscray identity whose I name I Portsmouth, thank you. Who's the local? And I said Selby. Yeah, so Isaac Selby was a, if you like, a white antiquarian. He organised historical events, usually celebrating the pioneers, the white pioneers. Uh, and Cooper, and so the day that's been celebrated is the day that Cooper, sorry, the day that Batman sails up the river and identifies this as a place, a village. And I should say, that the way Cooper and members of his family thought about Patton was very different to the way that I think most Victorian Aboriginal people think about Patton yeah. today. They, they think of Patton as a genocide just in the right. Um, I point out that, that, that Cooper and Doug Nichols and other members of the Australian Aboriginal Society actually thought of Patton as a good man. Why? Because in their view, he at least in making a treaty with Aboriginal people here, recognised that they were the owners of the land. Yeah? And so Cooper um, accepts invitations from Selby at some point to lay wreaths on Batman's grave, or what is believed to be his grave. Um, and I think, to what Uncle Bill said earlier about William Barrack, I think he's following in what is, I think, a tradition of, of a particular view of Batman as a, as a good man. Anyway. February 1937 in Footscray, they're invited to this event, marking this moment where Batman allegedly says this will be a place for the village, which, which becomes Melbourne. And as has been said, the leader of the Australian Natives Organisation, Natives Association, which is essentially a white nationalist organisation, which claims that white people are the natives, it displaces Aboriginal people as the natives or the indigenous people. And this president, I think his name was Holland, uh, of the Australian Natives Association gives the speech praising the white. And there's one of the few times in the historical record where you can tell that Cooper is absolutely outraged by this. And they also that he writes to Isaac Selby, and perhaps in a way that's typical of the time, Selby, without asking Cooper's permission, sends Cooper's letter to the Herald and publishes it. But the upside is that Cooper has really said to Selby, if you are going to continue to run uh, to, to, to uh, organise these events celebrating the pioneers and completely overlook that Aboriginal people are what we would call the first peoples, um, that this possession, the massacres, and all the rest of it, Cooper is saying, I will not stand for this. And I think this is a, a crucial moment because what Cooper formulates is that on days like that, days like Australia Day, Aboriginal people, what do they have to celebrate? And this is what he's saying. And I think what happens at that moment is that he starts to formulate his idea of a day of mourning that's going to take place on the 26th of January 1938. In other words, the day when the white invasion of Australia, in their terms, begins. And he and, he, he go, he and Margaret Tucker and Doug Nichols go up to Sydney to mark that day and to participate in the day of mourning. But it's his idea, and, and Cooper has, and I think he, he's drawing on his Christianity, he has a kind of historical vision in mind where there's, there's, there's days of loss, there are days of victory, there are days of mourning. And it's a kind of religious view of how time unfolds. It's a way of, I think, um, challenging a, a kind of secular view of And here in Footscray, he, he, he formulates this, you know, this, this, this crucial idea which has you know, come back and I think informs you know, so much of the politics, rightly so, today where he's saying you know, this is a history that has to be remembered, but the point of remembering it above all is to leverage things in the present to bring about not just the politics of recognition, but the, what I call and others the politics of, of redistribution. Redistributing the goods of Australia away from those who have most of them as you've probably seen letters to the age this morning where the unnameable former Australian Prime Minister is complaining that a small percentage of Australian people, Aboriginal people, are going to have a special right to lobby government. And as one of the letters to the age points out this morning, 
the unmentionable former Prime Minister of Australia, says nothing about the 2 or 3 percent of Australia's most wealthy people who just walk into Parliament and then have conversations with bureaucrats as a matter of course. They don't have to change the yeah. effing constitution to do this. Yeah, where was he when um, Apartheid was a thing in South Africa? It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, we could go on, but I think we're um, keen to, to wrap things up. Thanks, Daniel. And sorry, we will have to wrap up. So can you please all join me in thanking Bain and Daniel? I really appreciate your content. It was such a wonderful conversation, so educational and a timely opportunity to learn about the important work and life of William Cooper. So thank you. Much of that work that Bain spoke about happened at 27 Southampton Street. So whether it was the launching pad for uh, the, the march or not, a lot of the work of the Aboriginal event uh, Australian Aborigines League happened at that uh, particular residence. So it, um, in my view, is a historical value. You just want to get that in. Go <laughs> <laughs> back down. And and I, down I, and I, and so I, I agree with them. I made a submission to um, the Heritage Council, and what I said was that there was a, unquestionably that this house should be placed under the Prime Heritage District because, as Daniel said, at that time that he's living there, all of these, in my view, important things happened. This is the point where he submits the petition to the Australian government. This is the time where he suggests the idea of the day. Now, this is the time where he's instrumental in supporting the walk off of his people from coming to danger. This is the time where he raises questions about whether there should be um, an Aboriginal regiment. Okay. Right. Thank you. And just quickly, <laughs> our next event at Footscray Library is a treaty community forum. It's happening this Sunday afternoon. Uh, with the First People's Assembly of Victoria. It's an opportunity to learn about the Self-Determination Fund and processes for treaty making in Victoria, have a yarn and help shape the next steps on the journey. So if you're interested in the event, we'll have some flyers just behind you at the council table just over there. And also if you would like to give input on the types of programs and services we offer at the library, we'd love to hear your feedback on our draft library plan. So you can speak with council staff about that as well. Um, and Bain will now be signing some books just up the front of the library with copies available for purchase. So thanks again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs>